On Holy Thursday of the year 1527, a devoted crowd stands on the St. Peter's Square in Rome, awaiting the blessings of Pope Clement VII. At that very moment, an old man, a crucifix in one hand and a skull in the other, clambered onto the statue of St. Paul and shouted at Clement, Thou bastard of Sodom, for thy sins Rome shall be destroyed. Repent and turn thee. If thou wilt not believe me, in fourteen days thou shalt see it. He heralded unto Rome the very fate of the biblical towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, infernal fires burning all and everything to ashes. And indeed, two weeks later, on the 6th of May, the prophesied doom became all too real in the 1527 sack of Rome. An army of Emperor Charles V, enraged and completely beyond the control of its commanders, sacked the Holy City. The soldiers plundered, kidnapped and destroyed as they pleased. Rome was aflame. This video explains how contemporary historiography recounts the sack of Rome. The vague prophecies of Bartolomeo da Petroio, called Brandano, the prophet of Rome's doom, frequently became true due to the political troubles Italy was going through. In these turbulent times, Pope Clement VII, son of the mighty Florentine Medici family, had his own plans. As head of the Papal States, he tried to exploit the conflict between Habsburg Spain under Emperor Charles V and France, who both wanted to gain control over northern Italy. After the Battle of Picocca in April 1522, in which France suffered a bitter defeat at the hands of the Spanish guns, he turned against the Emperor in 1526. In the same year, France and the Papal States were joined by Milan, Florence and Venice and formed the League of Cognac to jointly fight Emperor Charles V. Soon, the Emperor ran out of money. His financial reserves had just been enough to recruit an army consisting of 14,000 Landsknechts under Georg of Frunsberg, 6,000 Spanish infantrymen and an uncertain number of Italian mercenaries. It was commanded by Charles III, Duke of Bourbon. However, the men, who were waiting idly in their field camps, hadn't received pay for more than a year after the Battle of Pavia in 1525. They also endured the hardships of winter. Soon, the money borrowed from Italian princes and the promises made to the mercenaries couldn't soothe the anger of the men any longer and in spring, the Landsknechts rose in open revolt and even threatened Frunsberg with the point of their pikes. Then, this one's glorious leader suffered a stroke and left the camp as a broken man. During the following days, the Duke of Bourbon and the other remaining leaders completely lost control over the army. Pressured by the men, the leaders took to their last resort. They led the army to Rome in order to force the Holy Father himself to pay the required sum. On their march south, the Imperial army sacked many small towns and villages. Florence was spared only because it was well guarded by an army of the League of Cognac. The Imperials arrived at the walls of Rome on the 5th of May and made camp on the Monte Mario. According to the historian Judith Hook, who wrote the standard reference on the sack of Rome, the city was defended only by about 2,000 men of the Swiss Guard and another 2,000 bande nere, that is, Italian mercenaries. They were supplemented with inexperienced and undisciplined men recruited from the city's population. But not only was there a lack of trained fighters, the defensive structures of the city too were in bad shape as they were stretched out and outdated. However, the attackers were ill-supplied too, had no artillery and the relief army of the League was closing in. Because the Duke of Bourbon, the commander of the Imperial Army, couldn't afford a drawn-out siege, his attack had to rely on the superior numbers of the Imperial forces and could only come from the northern bank of the Tiber, from where he wanted to scale the city, an undertaking that seemed impossible to most. Arriving at the city gates, Bourbon requested free passage and a ransom of 300,000 ducats, but the defenders declined. At about 4 o'clock in the morning of the 6th of May, 
The Lansknechts and the Spanish infantry were ready to attack the walls with the improvised wooden scales they had constructed during the night. Bourbon, all dressed in white, led the attack. While a duel of arquebuses began, the Imperials attacked the walls at three points, the Belvedere, the Porta Pertosa and close to the Porta San Spirito. There, the walls were lower and partially formed by the backside of a private house, which hadn't been adequately strengthened. The Imperials focused their attack on this point. Before the numerical advantage of the Imperial army took full effect, the men of the Swiss Guard gave the attackers a hard time, while the artillery of the castle St. Angelo caused heavy losses from a distance. Soon, however, thick fog hampered the sight of the defenders and silenced their artillery. It was precisely then when destiny stroke on both sides. The Duke of Bourbon was hit by an arquebus during the attack. The last and only commander whom the Landsknechts respected was suddenly dead. After a short halt, the Imperial attacks gained momentum again. Between 6 and 7 o'clock, the Imperialists entered the city at all three points of attack almost simultaneously. The defense collapsed right after the walls were lost. The intruding men conquered the rest of the city, bit by bit, killing whoever crossed their way. Pope Clement barely escaped to the castle St. Angelo through a secret passageway, while 147 out of the 189 Swiss guards covering his retreat were butchered. The impossible had happened. The internal city of Rome had been captured within only a day. The man so worn out by the hardships of winter and the march south grasped the opportunity to get their due. The leaderless imperial army, hungry for plunder, fell into disorder and began a reckless raid, sweeping through streets, killing, raping and plundering as they pleased. The contemporary Jacopo Buonaparte, calling to memory how Rome was sacked by the Huns and Vandals, sums up, quote, Every person, even if unarmed, was cut to pieces in those places which formerly Attila and Genserich, although the cruelest of men, had treated with religious respect. End quote. No one was spared. Man, woman and child, lay and ecclesiastic, Italian, French, Spanish and German. No one was spared. The rich of Rome were forced to pay enormous ransoms. Even the imperial agents in the city were not spared. The poor were tortured to reveal the hiding places of their valuables. While it was common that a city taken by storm was given no quarters, churches and the people of the church were usually protected. However, the Landsknechts were Protestant and filled with a built-up hatred against everything Catholic, which added to their will to commit atrocities. They crushed reliquaries, rifled tombs and raped nuns. The situation was absolutely out of control. Usually, the plundering of a city that refused to capitulate ended after three days. However, nothing could stop this plundering. It was the soldiers who controlled Rome, and no one could control them. Former commanders were now just the soldiery spokespersons, who were threatened if they did not act as the ordinary soldiers wished. This was especially problematic with the Landsknechts, since they were accustomed to debating and making decisions collectively. Bourbon's death had left a mutinous army without commander, but nobody wanted to take responsibility for the marauding and murdering hordes. It was not until December, seven months later, that Charles appointed Philbert de Chalon, Prince of Orange, as Captain General. While the numbers of plunderers in Rome grew by the day, the situation in the city soon became unbearable, giving even the battle-hardened mercenaries a bad stomach. In addition to the carnage, the horrible hygiene in the city and the lack of all sorts of necessities caused the outbreak of several epidemics, from which both inhabitants and soldiers were suffering horribly. The leaders of the army wanted to leave the city as soon as possible, but both Landsknechts and Spanish were determined to first get some money from the Pope. The Pope was in a desperate situation. The defenses of his last redoubt, the castle St. Angelo, held strong but all hope for help from the army of the League of Cognac was in vain. Actually, the cautious behavior of the League's commanders prevented them from obtaining an easy victory against the now totally undisciplined Imperial troops. 
Though finally, after some stalling for time, Clement agreed on the terms of capitulation on the 5th of June 1527. The garrison of the castle left unharmed, and the Pope promised to pay 400,000 scudi gold coins, and to hand over strategically important cities and to provide several hostages. However, these conditions were not fulfilled to their full extent, and the Landsknechts wanted to keep the Pope as a reassurance that they'd get the money he had promised to pay. They kept him until the 6th of December, when he agreed on new treaties, which were again only fulfilled in part. At the imperial court, the general sentiment was regret rather than rejoicing. The emperor denied all responsibility for the events and blamed them on the pope's political mistakes. It took long for Charles to learn about the situation and even longer until his orders and some funds reached Rome. Still, the weakening of his enemies came in handy. While most of the sacking took place on the first days, it was not until February of 1528 that the last imperial soldiers finally left Rome. By then, in addition to lives lost and suffering caused, Rome was deprived of 90% of its art treasures. The worth of the booty is estimated at 10 million ducats. The formerly prospering city, ravaged and depopulated, lost all its richness.